Tonight's lecture is over chapter 28, the genital reproductive systems. And tonight's lecture begins on page 1106. The male and female genital organs work together to produce offspring. In addition, the female genital organs contribute to sustaining the growth and development of embryos and fetuses. I find these systems interesting because I believe that this is one way that our species diverges a little bit. Furthermore, genital organs are adapted for producing new individuals and passing on genetic material from one generation to the next. The male and female genital organs can be grouped by function. The gonads, which are the testes in the males and the ovaries in the females, produce gametes and secrete sex hormones. The testes and the ovaries are also considered your primary sexual organs. Various ducts then store and transport the gametes, and accessory male, male genital glands produce substances that protect the gametes and facilitate their movement. Finally, supporting structures such as the penis in males and the uterus in females assist the delivery of gametes, and the uterus is also the site for the growth of the embryo and fetus during pregnancy. This cartoon shows figure 28.1 on page 1107, and it outlines the male genital organs and surrounding structures. So the organs of the male genital system include the testes, which is a system of ducts, including the epididymis, ductus deferens, ejaculatory ducts, and urethra. Also, the accessory male genital glands, which include the seminal glands, the prostate, and the bulbal urethral glands. And the male genital system also has several supporting structures, including the scrotum and the penis. The testes, which are the male gonads, produce sperm and secrete hormones. The duct system transports and stores sperm, assists in their maturation, and conveys them to the exterior. Semen contains sperm plus secretions provided by the accessory male genital glands. The supporting structures have various functions. The penis delivers sperm into the female genital tract and the scrotum supports the testes. So here are the functions of the male genital system. The testes produce sperm and the male sex hormone testosterone. The ducts transport, store, and assist in the maturation of sperm. The accessory male genital glands secrete most of the liquid portion of semen. And the penis contains the urethra, which is a passageway for the ejaculation of semen and the excretion of urine. And this is page 1108, figure 28.1 in your book. And this shows a cadaveric version of the male genital system. Moving on to the next slide. This cartoon is on page 1109, and this is figure 28.2. The scrotum, which is a supporting structure for the testes, consists of loose skin and underlying subcutaneous tissue that hangs from the root of the penis. Externally, the scrotum looks like a single pouch of skin separated into lateral portions by a median ridge called the raphe. Internally, the scrotal septum divides the scrotum into two compartments, each containing a single testis. The septum is made up of subcutaneous tissue and muscle tissue called the dartos muscle, which is composed of bundles of smooth muscle fibers. The dartos muscle is found in the subcutaneous tissue of the scrotum. Associated with each testes in the scrotum is the cremaster muscle. The cremaster muscle is a series of small bands of skeletal muscle that descend as an extension of the internal abdominal oblique muscle through the spermatic cord to surround the testes. The location of the scrotum and the contraction of its muscle fibers regulate the temperature of the testes. Normal sperm production requires a temperature about 2 to 3 degrees Celsius below the core body temperature. 
This lowered temperature is maintained within the scrotum because it is outside of the pelvic cavity. In response to cold temperatures, the cremaster and dartos muscles contract. Contraction of the cremaster muscles moves the testes closer to the body where they can absorb body heat. Contraction of the dartos muscle causes the scrotum to become tight, which then in turn reduces heat loss. Exposure to warmth reverses these actions. Moving on to the next slide, the testes are paired oval glands in the scrotum. The testes develop near the kidneys in the posterior portion of the abdomen, and they usually begin their descent into the scrotum through the ingual canals during the latter half of the seventh month of fetal development. A serous membrane called the tunica vaginalis, which is derived from the peritoneum and forms during the descent of the testes, partially covers the testes. Internal to the tunica vaginalis, the testis is surrounded by a white fibrous capsule composed of dense irregular connective tissue called the tunica albuginea. It extends inward, forming septa that divide the testis into a series of internal compartments called lobules. Each of the two to three hundred lobules contain one to three tightly coiled tubules. These tubules are called the seminiferous tubules, and this is where sperm is produced. The process by which the seminiferous tubules of the testes produce sperm is called spermatogenesis. The seminiferous tubules contain two types of cells. One is called spermatogonia, and these are the sperm-forming cells, and the other type of cell is called a nurse cell. Nurse cells have several functions in supporting spermatogenesis. Moving on to the next slide, this is figure 28.3 on page 1110. And in this cartoon, we see the internal and external anatomy of a testis. And in this next slide, we see a cadaveric view, both lateral and sagittal, of the testis. And in this next slide, we see figure 28.4 on page 1111. This shows the microscopic anatomy of the seminiferous tubules and the stages of sperm production, or spermatogenesis. The arrows indicate the progression of cells from least mature to most mature. The N and 2N refer to the haploid and diploid numbers of chromosomes, respectively. And then just a reminder that spermatogenesis occurs in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. In humans, spermatogenesis takes 65 to 75 days. The sperm production begins with the spermatogonia, which contain the diploid number of chromosomes. Spermatogonia are considered stem cells. When they undergo mitosis, some spermatogonia remain near the basement membrane of the seminiferous tubules in an undifferentiated state to serve as a reservoir of cells for future cell divisions and subsequent sperm production. The rest of the spermatogonia lose contact with the basement membrane and squeeze through the tight junctions of the blood testis barrier and undergo developmental changes would, where they differentiate into the primary spermatocytes. And like the spermatogonia, the primary spermatocytes are also diploid. Moving on to the next slide, shortly after it forms, each primary spermatocyte replicates its DNA and then begins meiosis. In meiosis one, homologous pairs of chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate and crossing over occurs. Then the meiotic spindle pulls one duplicated chromosome from each pair to an opposite pole of the, the dividing cell. The two cells formed by meiosis one are called secondary spermatocytes and each secondary spermatocyte has 23 chromosomes, so they're now in the haploid state. 
Each chromosome within a secondary spermatocyte, however, is made up of two chromatids still attached by a central mirror. No replication of DNA occurs in the secondary spermatocytes. At the next step, which is meiosis II, the chromosomes line up in single file along the metaphase plate and the two chromatids of each chromosome separate. The four haploid cells resulting from meiosis II are called spermatids. A single primary spermatocyte therefore produces four spermatids with the haploid number via two rounds of cell division, which we term meiosis I and meiosis II. And in this cartoon that we see on page 1112, figure 28.5, we see the events in spermatogenesis. The diploid cells have 46 chromosomes and the haploid cells have 23 chromosomes. The final stage of spermatogenesis is called spermiogenesis, and this is the maturation of the haploid spermatids into sperm. No cell division occurs in spermiogenesis, but each spermatid becomes a single sperm. During this process, spherical spermatids transform into elongated slender sperm. An acrosome forms atop of the nucleus, which condenses and elongates. A flagellum develops and mitochondria multiply. Nurse cells dispose of the excess cytoplasm and slough off. Finally, sperm are released from their connections to the nurse cells in an event known as spermiation. Sperm then enter the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. Fluid secreted by the nurse cells push the sperm along their way toward the ducts of the testes. At this point, sperm are not able to swim. Moving on to the next slide, each day about 300 million sperm complete the process of spermatogenesis. The major parts of a sperm are the head and tail. The flattened pointed head of the sperm contains a nucleus with 23 highly condensed chromosomes. Covering the anterior two-thirds of the nucleus is the acrosome. The acrosome is a cap-like vesicle filled with enzymes that help sperm to penetrate a secondary oocyte and bring about fertilization. The tail of a sperm is subdivided into four parts, the neck, middle piece, principal piece, and end piece. The neck is the constricted region just behind the head that contains centrioles. The centrioles form microtubules that comprise the remainder of the tail. The middle piece contains mitochondria arranged in a spiral which provide energy or ATP for the locomotion of sperm to the site of fertilization for sperm metabolism. The principal piece is the longest portion of the tail and the end piece is the terminal tapering portion of the tail. Once ejaculated, most sperm do not survive more than 48 hours within the female genital tract. And this cartoon shows figure 28.6 on page 1113. And this just shows us the parts of the sperm that we were just talking about on the previous slide. Moving on to the next slide. Although the initiating factors are unknown, at puberty, certain hypothalamic neurosecretory cells increase their secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. This hormone stimulates gonadotropic cells in the anterior pituitary to increase the secretion of the two gonadotropins, which are luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. Luteinizing hormone stimulates the interstitial endocrine cells, which are located between the seminiferous tubules, to secrete the hormone testosterone. Testosterone is a steroid hormone that is synthesized from cholesterol in the testes and is the principal androgen. It is lipid-soluble and readily diffuses out of the interstitial cells into the interstitial fluid and then into blood. Via negative feedback, testosterone suppresses a secretion of luteinizing hormone by the anterior pituitary gonadotrophs and suppresses a secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormone by the hypothalamic neurosecretory cells. 
There is an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase that converts testosterone into another androgen called dihydrotestosterone in the external genitals and prostate. And follicle-stimulating hormone indirectly works to stimulate spermatogenesis. Follicle-stimulating hormone and testosterone act synergistically on the nurse cells to stimulate the secretion of androgen-binding protein into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules and into the interstitial fluid around the spermatogonia. And this cartoon is found on page 1113 in your book, figure 28.7. This cartoon outlines the hormonal control of spermatogenesis and the actions of testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. So in response to the stimulation by follicle-stimulating hormone and testosterone, nurse cells secrete androgen-binding protein. The dashed red lines indicate the negative feedback inhibition. The release of follicle-stimulating hormone is stimulated by the gonadotropin-releasing hormone and inhibited by testosterone. Moving on to the next slide, Testosterone and dihydrotestosterone both bind to the same androgen receptors which are found within the nuclei of target cells. The hormone receptor complex regulates gene expression, turning some genes on and others off. Because of these changes, the androgens produce several effects. One is prenatal development. Before birth, testosterone stimulates the male pattern of development of genital system ducts in the descent of the testes. Dihydrotestosterone stimulates the development of the external genitals. Testosterone also is converted in the brain to estrogens, which are feminizing hormones, which may play a role in the development of certain regions of the brain in males. Testosterone and dihydrotestosterone also contribute to the development of the male sexual characteristics. So at puberty, testosterone and dihydrotestosterone bring about the development and enlargement of the male sex organs and the development of masculine secondary sexual characteristics. Secondary sex characteristics are traits that distinguish males and females but do not have a direct role in reproduction. These include muscular and skeletal growth, which results in wide shoulders and narrow hips, facial and chest hair, and more hair on other parts of the body. Also, thickening of the skin, increased sebaceous gland secretions, and the enlargement of the larynx is a consequence of deepening the voice in males. Furthermore, a negative feedback system regulates testosterone production. And moving on to figure 28.8 on page 1114, we see this negative feedback control loop. So when testosterone concentration in the blood increases to a certain level, it inhibits the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone by the cells in the hypothalamus. As a result, there is less gonadotropin-releasing hormone in the blood that flows from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary. The gonadotropic cells in the anterior pituitary then release less luteinizing hormone, so the concentration of luteinizing hormone in the systemic blood falls. With less stimulation by luteinizing hormone, the interstitial endocrine cells in the testes secrete less testosterone, and there is a return to homeostasis. If the testosterone concentration in the blood falls too low, gonadotropin-releasing hormone is again released by the hypothalamus, and this stimulates the secretion of luteinizing hormone by the anterior pituitary. Then luteinizing hormone stimulates testosterone production by the testes. Moving on to the next slide. There is a system of ducts in the male reproductive system. Sperm and fluid travel from the seminiferous tubules to straight tubules and then to a network of ducts in the reet testis. Efferent ducts carry the sperm to the epididymis. Sperm mature in the epididymis and degenerated sperm are reabsorbed. 
the epididymis propel sperm into the vas deferens. So this cartoon on page 1116, figure 28.9 in your textbook, shows the location of several accessory male genital glands. The prostate, urethra, and penis have been sectioned to show the internal details. So the functions of the accessory male genital gland secretions include the seminal glands, which secrete seminal fluid. This is an alkaline, viscous fluid that helps neutralize acid in the female genital tract. It also provides fructose for ATP production by sperm, contributes to sperm motility and viability, and helps semen coagulate after ejaculation. Also, the prostate secretes prostatic fluid, which is a milky, slightly acidic fluid that contains enzymes that break down clotting proteins from the seminal glands. And then the bubble urethral glands secrete an alkaline fluid that neutralizes the acidic environment in the urethra and mucus that lubricates the lining of the urethra and the tip of the penis during sexual intercourse. Moving on to the next slide, within the tail of the epididymis, the duct of the epididymis becomes less convoluted and its diameter increases. Beyond this point, the duct is known as the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. So the vas deferens exits the tail of the epididymis and ascends through the spermatic cord into the pelvis. Then it loops over the ureter and passes over the side and down the posterior surface of the urinary bladder. And in this slide, we go back to figure 28.9, but now we're on page 1117. And this shows the posterior view of the male accessory organs of reproduction in its cadaveric format. Moving on to the next slide. The spermatic cord is a supporting structure of the male genital system that ascends out of the scrotum. It contains the ductus deferens, testicular artery, veins draining the testes, autonomic nerves, lymphatic vessels, and the cremaster muscle. The spermatic cord and the ilioingual nerve pass through the ingual canal, which originates at the deep ingual ring and ends at the superficial ingual ring. So moving on to the next slide, this cartoon is figure 28.2, so we have to go back to page 1109 in our book. And this shows the scrotum and the supporting structures for the testes. The scrotum consists of loose skin and an underlying subcutaneous tissue that supports the testes. Moving on to the next slide, each ejaculatory duct is formed by the union of the duct from the seminal gland and the ampulla of the ductus deferens. The short ejaculatory ducts form just superior to the base of the prostate and pass inferiorly and anteriorly through the prostate. They terminate in the prosthetic urethra where they eject sperm and the seminal gland secretions just before the release of semen from the urethra to the exterior. And this cartoon is on page 1119 and this is figure 28.10. This shows the internal structure of the penis and the mechanism of erection. So something that's unique about the male reproductive system is that the urethra is used for both the excretion of urine and the ejaculation of semen. Moving on to the next slide. The ducts of the male genital system store and transport sperm, but the accessory male genital glands secrete most of the liquid portion of semen. The accessory male genital glands include the seminal glands, the prostate, and the bulbal urethral glands. The paired seminal glands, or seminal vesicles, are convoluted pouch-like structures. They lie just posterior to the base of the urinary bladder and anterior to the rectum. Through the seminal gland ducts, the seminal glands secrete seminal fluid, which is an alkaline viscous fluid that contains fructose, prostaglandins, and clotting proteins that are different from those in blood. 
The alkaline nature of the seminal fluid helps to neutralize the acidic environment of the male urethra and female genital tract that would otherwise inactivate and kill sperm. The fructose is used for ATP production by sperm. Prostaglandins contribute to sperm motility and viability and may stimulate smooth muscle contractions within the female genital tract. The clotting proteins help semen coagulate after ejaculation. It is thought that the coagulation occurs in order to keep sperm from leaking from the vagina. Fluid secreted by the seminal glands normally constitutes about 60% of the volume of semen. The prostate is a single donut-shaped gland about the size of a golf ball. The prostate is inferior to the urinary bladder and surrounds the prostatic urethra. The prostate slowly increases in size from birth to puberty. It then expands rapidly until about age 30, after which time its size typically remains stable until about 45. At that point, the prostate may enlarge, and if that happens, that can constrict the urethra and interfere with urine flow. The prostate secretes prostatic fluid, which is a milky and slightly acidic fluid that contains several substances. One is citric acid. In the prostatic fluid, this is used by sperm for ATP production via the Krebs cycle. It also produces several proteolytic enzymes such as prostate-specific antigen, pepsigen, lysozyme, amylase, and hyaluronidase. These eventually break down the clotting proteins from the seminal glands. And we also have the acid phosphatase whose function is unknown at this point in time. And seminal plasmin is an antibiotic that can destroy bacteria. Seminal plasmin may help decrease the number of naturally occurring bacteria in semen and in the lower female genital tract. Secretions of the prostate enter the prostatic urethra through many prostatic ducts. Prostatic secretions make up about 25% of the volume of semen and contribute to sperm motility and viability. The paired bulbal urethral glands or Cowper's glands are located inferior to the prostate on either side of the membranous urethra within the deep muscles of the perineum and the ducts open into the spongy urethra. These glands are about the size of peas. During sexual arousal, the bulbal urethral glands secrete an alkaline fluid into the urethra that protects the passing sperm by neutralizing acids from urine in the urethra. They also secrete mucus that lubricates the end of the penis and the lining of the urethra. This decreases the number of sperm damage during ejaculation. Some males release a drop or two of this mucus upon sexual arousal and erection. This fluid does not contain sperm. Moving on to the next slide. Semen is a mixture of sperm and seminal fluid. It's a liquid that consists of the secretions of the seminiferous tubules, seminal glands, prostate, and bulbal urethral glands. The volume of semen in a typical ejaculation is 2.5 to 5 milliliters with 50 to 150 million sperm per milliliter. Despite the slight acidity of prostatic fluid, the semen still has a slightly alkaline pH of 7.2 to 7.7 .7 due to the higher pH and larger volume of the fluid from the seminal glands. The prostatic fluid gives semen a milky appearance, and fluids from the seminal glands and the bulbo urethral glands give it a sticky consistency. Seminal fluid provides sperm with a transportation medium, nutrients, and protection from the hostile acidic environments of the male urethra and the female vagina. Once ejaculated, liquid semen coagulates within about five minutes due to the pre presence of clotting factors from the seminal glands. After about 10 to 20 minutes, the semen reliquifies because the prostate-specific antigen and other proteolytic enzymes produced by the prostate break down the clot. The penis contains part of the spongy urethra and is the passageway for the ejaculation of semen and the excretion of urine. 
Its cylindrical shape consists of a body, glands, penis, and root. The body of the penis is composed of three cylindrical masses of tissue, each surrounded by dense irregular connective tissue called the tunica albuginea. The two dorsal lateral masses are called the corpora cavernosa penis, and the smaller midventral mass, the corpus spongiosum penis, contains the spongy urethra and keeps it open during ejaculation. Skin and subcutaneous tissue enclose all three masses, which consists of erectile tissue. Erectile tissue is composed of numerous blood sinuses lined by endothelial cells and surrounded by smooth muscle and elastic connective tissue. The distal end of the corpus spongiosum penis is a slightly enlarged acorn-shaped region called the glans penis. Its margin is the corona. The distal urethra enlarges within the glans penis and forms a terminal slit-like opening called the external urethral orifice. Covering the glands in an uncircumcised penis is the loosely fitting prepuce or foreskin. This can be removed in a surgical procedure called circumcision. The root of the penis is the attached portion or the proximal end of the penis. It consists of the bulb of the penis and the crura of the penis. So this next slide is back to figure 28.10 on page 1119. And this shows a transverse section of the penis in both cartoon and cadaveric format. Moving on to the next slide. Upon sexual stimulation, parasympathetic fibers from the sacral portion of the spinal cord initiate and maintain an erection. This is the enlargement and stiffening of the penis. The parasympathetic fibers produce and release nitric oxide. The nitric oxide causes smooth muscles in the walls of the arterioli supplying the erectile tissue to dilate or relax. This in turn causes large amounts of blood to enter the erectile tissue of the penis. Nitric oxide also causes the smooth muscle within the erectile tissue to relax, resulting in the widening of the blood sinuses. The combination of increased blood flow and the widening of the blood sinuses results in an erection. Expansion of the blood sinuses also compresses the veins that drain the penis. This slows the blood outflow and helps to maintain the erection. The insertion of the erect penis into the vagina is called sexual intercourse or coitus. The major stimulus for erection is the mechanical stimulation of the penis. Mechanoreceptors provide direct input to the erection integrating center in the spinal cord. Erotic sights, sounds, smells, and thoughts can also stimulate erection. This involves descending inputs from the brain to the spinal cord. Negative stimuli, such as a bad mood, depression, anxiety, etc., can also inhibit the erection through these descending pathways. Ejaculation is the powerful release of semen from the urethra to the exterior. This is a sympathetic reflex coordinated by the lumbar portion of the spinal cord. As part of the reflex, the smooth muscle sphincter at the base of the urinary bladder closes, preventing urine from being expelled during ejaculation and semen from entering the urinary bladder. Even before ejaculation occurs, the peristaltic contractions in the epididymis, ductus deferens, seminal glands, ejaculatory ducts, and prostate propel semen into the spongy urethra. Typically, this leads to emission, the discharge of a small volume of semen before ejaculation. Emission may also occur during sleep. This is called nocturnal emission. The penis is not a muscle, but it is supported by some muscles. And upon ejaculation, these muscles also contract. 
Once sexual stimulation of the penis has ended, the arterioli supplying the erectile tissue of the penis constrict and the smooth muscles within the erectile tissue contract. This makes the blood sinuses smaller. This relieves the pressure on the veins supplying the penis and allows the blood to drain through them. Consequently, the penis returns to its flaccid or relaxed state. And this next slide is a continuation of figure 28.10, but now we're on page 1120 in the book. And this shows the male reproductive system neural circuits involved in erection. Moving on to the female genital system, and this cartoon is on page 1122, figure 28.11 in your book. The organs of the female genital system include the ovaries, which are the female gonads, the uterine tubes, the oviducts, the uterus, the vagina, and external organs, which are collectively called the vulva. The mammary glands are considered part of both the integumentary system and the female genital system. Gynecology is a specialized branch of medicine concerned with the diagnosis and treatment of diseases of the female genital system. So the functions of the female genital system include the ovaries, which produce secondary oocytes and hormones, including progesterone, and estrogens, which are female sex hormones. They also produce inhibin and relaxin. Also, the uterine tubes transport secondary oocytes to the uterus and normally are the sites where fertilization occurs. Furthermore, the uterus is a site of implantation of the fertilized ovum, development of the fetus during pregnancy and labor. The vagina receives the penis during sexual intercourse and is a passageway for childbirth. And the mammary glands synthesize, secrete, and eject milk for the nourishment of the newborn. And this next slide is on page 1123. It's still part of figure 28.11. This just shows us the cadaveric view of the female reproductive organs. Moving on to the next slide, the ovaries, which are the female gonads, are paired glands that resemble unshelled almonds in size and shape. They are homologous to the testes. In other words, the ovaries and the testes share the same embryonic origin. The ovaries produce gametes, secondary oocytes that develop into mature ova or eggs after fertilization, and hormones including progesterone and estrogens. Estrogens are the female sex hormones. They also produce inhibin and relaxin. The ovaries on either side of the uterus descend to the brim of the superior portion of the pelvic cavity during the third month of development. A series of ligaments holds them in position. The broad ligament of the uterus, which is the fold of the parietal peritoneum, attaches the ovaries by a double-layered fold of peritoneum called the mesovarium. The ovarian ligament anchors the ovaries to the uterus, and the suspensory ligament attaches them to the pelvic wall. Each ovary contains a hilum, the point of entrance and exit for blood vessels and nerves along which the mesovarium is attached. And this is figure 28.12 on page 1123. And this shows the relative position of the ovaries, the uterus, and the ligaments that support them. Ligaments holding the ovaries in position are the mesovarium, the ovarian ligament, and the suspensory ligament. Moving on to the next slide, each ovary consists of the following parts. The ovarian mesothelium is a layer of simple epithelium that covers the surface of the ovary. The tunica albuginea is a whitish capsule of dense irregular connective tissue located immediately deep to the ovarian mesothelium. 
the ovarian cortex is a region just deep to the tunica albuginea. It consists of ovarian follicles surrounded by dense irregular connective tissue that contains collagen fibers and fibroblast-like cells called the stromal cells. The ovarian medulla is deep to the ovarian cortex. The border between the cortex and the medulla is indistinct, but the medulla consists of more loosely arranged connective tissue, and it contains blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves. Moving on to the next slide, ovarian follicles are in the cortex and consist of oocytes in various stages of development, plus the cells surrounding them. Oocytes are immature egg cells, or what we would call ova. When the surrounding cells form a single layer, they are called follicular cells later in development. When they form several layers, they are referred to as granulosa cells. The surrounding cells nourish the developing oocyte and begin to secrete estrogens as the ovarian follicle grows larger. The graphene follicle, or the tertiary ovarian follicle, is a large, fluid-filled ovarian follicle that is ready to rupture and expel its secondary oocyte. This is a process known as ovulation. And the corpus luteum contains the remnants of the tertiary ovarian follicle after ovulation. The corpus luteum produces progesterone, estrogens, relaxins, and inhibin until it degenerates into a fibrous scar tissue called the corpus albicans. And this cartoon brings us to page 1124, figure 28.13, and it shows the histology of the ovary. The arrows indicate the sequence of developmental stages that occur as part of the maturation of an ovum during the ovarian cycle. Moving on to the next slide, the formation of gametes in the ovaries is termed ogenesis. In contrast to spermatogenesis, which begins in males at puberty, ogenesis in females occurs before they are born. Ogenesis occurs in essentially the same manner as spermatogenesis. And what I mean by that is that meiosis occurs, and that results in germ cells that undergo maturation. During early fetal development, primordial germ cells migrate from the umbilical vesicle to the ovaries. There, the germ cells differentiate within the ovaries into ogonia, Ogonia are diploid stem cells that divide mitotically to produce millions of germ cells. Even before birth, most of these germ cells degenerate in a process known as artresia. A few, however, develop into larger cells called primary oocytes that enter the prophase of meiosis I during fetal development but do not complete that phase until after puberty. During this arrested stage of development, each primary oocyte is surrounded by a single layer of flat follicular cells and the entire structure is called a primordial ovarian follicle. Moving on to the next slide. Then, each month after puberty until menopause, gonadotropins such as follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone secreted by the anterior pituitary further stimulate the development of several primordial ovarian follicles, although only one will typically reach the maturity needed for ovulation. A few primordial ovarian follicles start to grow, developing into primary ovarian follicles. Each primary ovarian follicle consists of a primary oocyte that is surrounded in a later stage of development by several layers of cuboidal and low columnar cells called granulosa cells. Moving on to the next slide. As the primary ovarian follicle grows, it forms a clear glycoprotein layer called the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is found between the primary oocyte and the granulosa cells. In addition, stromal cells surrounding the basement membrane begin to form an organized layer. This layer is called the theca folliculi. 
Moving on to the next slide, this is figure 28.14, page 1125. And here we see a cartoon of a primary follicle and a micrograph of the ovarian cortex. And in this next slide, we're on the same page looking at the same figure. And this is showing us a cartoon of the late primary follicle. And moving on to the next slide, we see the same figure on the same page. And now we're looking at a secondary follicle, both in cartoon form and in light micrograph form. Moving on to the next slide, with the continuing maturation, a primary ovarian follicle develops into a secondary follicle. In a secondary follicle, the theca differentiates into two layers. One is the theca interna. The theca interna is a highly vascularized internal layer of cuboidal secretory cells that secrete androgens. And it also differentiates into the theca externa. The theca externa is an outer layer of stromal cells and collagen fibers. In addition, the granulosa cells begin to secrete follicular fluid, which builds up in a cavity called the antrum in the center of the secondary ovarian follicle. The innermost layer of the granulosa cells become firmly attached to the zona pellucida and is now called the corona radiata. Then, the secondary ovarian follicle eventually becomes larger, turning into a tertiary ovarian follicle. And it's important to point out here that while in this ovarian follicle, and just before ovulation, the diploid primary oocyte completes meiosis I, and this produces two haploid cells of unequal size. Each contain 23 chromosomes. The smaller cell produced by meiosis I is called the first polar body, and this is essentially a packet of discarded nuclear material. The larger cell, known as the secondary oocyte, receives most of the cytoplasm. Once a secondary oocyte is formed, it begins meiosis II, but then stops in metaphase. The tertiary follicle soon ruptures and releases a secondary oocyte, and this is a process known as ovulation. At ovulation, the secondary oocyte is expelled into the pelvic cavity together with the first polar body and the corona radiata. Normally, these cells are swept into the uterine tube. If fertilization does not occur, the cells degenerate. If sperm are present in the uterine tube and one penetrates a secondary oocyte, however, meiosis II resumes. The secondary oocyte splits into two haploid cells, again of unequal size. The larger is the ovum, or mature egg, and the smaller one is the second polar body. The nuclei of the sperm and the ovum then unite, forming a diploid zygote. If the first polar body undergoes another division to produce two polar bodies, then the primary oocyte ultimately gives rise to three haploid polar bodies, which all degenerate, and a single haploid ovum. By contrast, recall that in males, one primary spermatocyte produces four gametes, or four sperm. So this next slide is on page 1125 and 1126. Uh, we see the mature graphene follicle in this one and a scanning electron micrograph of a secondary follicle in an ovary. So moving on to figure 28.15 on page 1127, and this shows the process of oogenesis. In a secondary oocyte, meiosis II is completed only if fertilization occurs. So moving on to table 28.1 on page 1128, this shows a summary of oogenesis and follicular developments. As I do with all tables, I will let you review this table on your own time. 
moving on to the next slide, females have two uterine tubes, also called fallopian tubes or oviducts. They extend laterally from the uterus. The tubes lie within the folds of the broad ligaments of the uterus. They provide a route for sperm to reach the ovum and transport secondary oocytes and fertilized ova from the ovaries to the uterus. The funnel-shaped portion of each end of the tube is called the infundibulum, and this is close to the ovary, but it is open to the pelvic cavity. It ends in a fringe of finger-like projections called fimbrae, one of which is attached to the lateral end of the ovary. From the infundibulum, the uterine tube extends medially and eventually inferiorly and attaches to the superior lateral angle of the uterus. The ampulla of the uterine tube is the widest, longest portion, making up about the lateral two-thirds of its length. The isthmus of the uterine tube is the more medial, short, narrow, thick-walled portion that joins the uterus. And in this cartoon, we turn to page 1129. This is figure 28.16. And this shows the relationship of the uterine tubes to the ovaries, uterus, and associated structures. In the left side of the drawing, the uterine tube and uterus have been sectioned to show the internal structures. So after ovulation, a secondary oocyte and its corona radiata move from the pelvic cavity into the infundibulum of the uterine tube. The uterus is the site of menstruation, implantation of a fertilized ovum, development of the fetus, and labor. Moving on to the next slide, histologically, the uterine tubes are composed of three layers, the mucosa, the muscular layer, and the serosa. The mucosa consists of epithelium and lamina propria. The epithelium contains ciliated, simple columnar cells which function as a ciliary conveyor belt to help move a fertilized ovum within the uterine tube towards the uterus and non-ciliated cells called PEG cells which have microvilli and secrete a fluid that provides nutrition for the ovum. The middle layer the muscular layer is composed of an inner thick circular ring of smooth muscle and an outer thin region of longitudinal smooth muscle. Peristaltic contractions of the muscular layer and the ciliary action of the mucosa help move the oocyte or fertilized ovum toward the uterus. The outer layer of the uterine tubes is a serous membrane. The serosa is formed by the visceral peritoneum. And this brings us to page 1130, figure 28.17, where we see micrographs of the uterine tube. Moving on to the next slide. Situated between the urinary bladder and the rectum, the uterus is the size and shape of a pear. The anatomical subdivisions of the uterus include a dome-shaped portion superior to the uterine tubes called the fundus, a tapering central portion called the body, and an inferior narrow portion called the cervix. The cervix opens into the vagina. Between the body of the uterus and the cervix is the isthmus. This is a constricted region. Moving on to the next slide. The inferior body of the uterus is called the uterine cavity, and the interior of the cervix is called the cervical canal. The cervical canal opens into the uterine cavity at the internal os, and into the vagina at the external os. Moving on to the next slide, histologically, the uterus consists of three layers of tissue, the parametrium, the myometrium, and the endometrium. The parametrium, or serosa, is part of the visceral peritoneum. It is composed of simple squamous epithelium and areolar connective tissue. Laterally, it becomes the broad ligament. 
anteriorly, the peritoneum reflects off the uterus to cover the urinary bladder and forms a shallow pouch called the vesicouterine pouch. Posteriorly, it covers the rectum and forms a deep pouch between the uterus and rectum called the rectouterine pouch. The middle layer of the uterus is the muscular layer called the myometrium, and it consists of three layers of smooth muscle fibers that are thickest in the fundus and thinnest in the cervix. The thicker middle layer is circular, and the inner and outer layers are longitudinal or oblique. During labor and childbirth, coordinated contractions of the myometrium in response to oxytocin from the posterior pituitary help expel the fetus from the uterus. The inner layer of the uterus is the mucosa, which is lightly vascularized and referred to as the endometrium. It has three layers, the compact layer, the functional layer, and the basal layer of the endometrium. The functional layer is shed each month during menstruation, and the basal layer is permanent and gives rise to a new functional layer after each menstruation. And this is page 1131, figure 28.18. And here we're looking at some micrographs of the uterus. So we can see in this slide that there are three layers of the uterus from superficial to deep. And these layers are the parametrium or the serosa, the myometrium, and the endometrium. Moving on to the next slide. Branches of the internal iliac artery, called the uterine arteries, supply blood to the uterus. Uterine arteries give off branches called arcuate arteries. These arcuate arteries are arranged in a circular fashion in the myometrium. These arteries branch into radial arteries that penetrate deeply into the myometrium. Just before the branches enter the endometrium, they divide into two kinds of arterioles. Straight arterioles, which supply the basal layer with the materials needed to regenerate the compact and functional layers. Spiral arterioles, which supply the functional layer and change markedly during the menstruation cycle. Blood leaving the uterus is drained by the uterine veins into the internal iliac veins. The extensive blood supply of the uterus is essential to support the regrowth of new compact and functional layers after menstruation, to support the implantation of a fertilized ovum, and to support the development of the placenta. This cartoon appears on page 1132, and this is figure 28.19. And this simply shows the blood supply of the uterus. And moving on to the next slide, uh, this is going back to page 1131, figure 28.18. This is the scanning electron micrograph that we see there of the endometrium during the secretory phase. The secretory cells of the mucosa of the cervix produce a secretion called cervical mucus. This is a mixture of water, glycoproteins, lipids, enzymes, and inorganic salts. During their reproductive years, females secrete 20 to 60 milliliters of cervical mucus per day. Cervical mucus is more hospitable to sperm at or near the time of ovulation because it is less viscous and more alkaline. It has a pH of about 8.5. At other times, a more viscous mucus forms a cervical plug that physically impedes sperm penetration. Cervical mucus supplements the energy needs of sperm, and both the cervix and cervical mucus protect sperm from phagocytes in the hostile environment of the vagina and uterus. Cervical mucus may also play a role in capacitation. This is a series of functional changes that sperm undergo in the female genital tract before they are able to fertilize a secondary oocyte. Capacitation causes the tail of a sperm to beat even more vigorously, and it prepares the plasma membrane of the sperm to fuse with the oocyte's plasma membrane. Moving on to the next slide, 
This cartoon takes us back to page 1122, figure 28.11. But the write-up on the vagina occurs on page 1132. The vagina is a tubular, long fibromuscular canal lined with a mucous membrane that extends from the exterior of the body to the uterine cervix. It is the receptacle for the penis during sexual intercourse, the outlet for menstrual flow, and the passageway for childbirth. Situated between the urinary bladder and the rectum, the vagina is directed superiorly and posteriorly where it attaches to the uterus. A recess called the fornix surrounds the vaginal attachment to the cervix. And these micrographs are found on page 1133, figure 28.20. And they show the vagina and the components of the vulva. The vulva refers to the external genitals of the female. The mucosa of the vagina is continuous with that of the uterus. Histologically speaking, it consists of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and areolar connective tissues that lie in a series of transverse folds called the vaginal rugae. The mucosa of the vagina contains large stores of glycogen, the decomposition of which produces organic acids. The resulting acidic environment retards microbial growth but is also harmful to sperm. Moving on to the next slide. As I said previously, the epithelium and areolar connective tissue of the vagina lie in a series of transverse folds called the rugae. The muscular layer is composed of an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle that can stretch considerably to accommodate the penis during sexual intercourse and a child during birth. The adventitia is a superficial layer of the vagina and this consists of the areolar connective tissue. It anchors the vagina to the adjacent organs such as the urethra and the urinary bladder anteriorly and the rectum and anal canal posteriorly. A thin layer of vascularized mucous membrane called the hymen forms a border around and partially closes the inferior end of the vaginal opening to the exterior or the vaginal orifice. The hymen is of variable size and shape and sometimes is not even present. Sometimes the hymen completely covers the vaginal orifice in a condition called imperforate hymen. And surgery may be needed to open the orifice and permit the discharge of menstrual flow. Moving on to the next slide, the vulva refers to the external genitals of the female and the following components make up the vulva. Anterior to the vaginal and urethral openings is the mons pubis. This is an elevation of adipose tissue covered by skin and coarse pubic hair that cushions the pubic symphysis. From the mons pubis, two longitudinal folds of skin, the labia majora, extend inferiorly and posteriorly. The singular term is labia magus. The labia majora are covered by pubic hair and contain an abundance of adipose tissue, sebaceous glands, and apocrine sudoriferous glands. They are homologous to the scrotum. Medial to the labia majora are two smaller folds of skin called the labia minora. The singular term is labia minus. Unlike the labia majora, the labia minora are devoid of pubic hair and fat and have few sudoriferous glands, but they do contain many sebaceous glands which produce antimicrobial substances and provide some lubrication during sexual intercourse. The labia minora are homologous to the spongy urethra. The clitoris is a small cylindrical mass composed of two small erectile bodies, the capora cavernosa and numerous blood vessels and nerves. The clitoris is located 
at the anterior junction of the labia minora, a layer of skin called the prepus of the clitoris is formed at the point where the labia minora unite and cover the body of the clitoris. The exposed portion of the clitoris is the glans clitoris. The clitoris is homologous to the glans penis in males. Like the male structure, the clitoris is capable of enlargement on tactile stimulation and has a role in sexual excitement in the female. The region between the labia minora is the vestibule. Within the vestibule are the hymen, that is if it's still present, the vaginal orifice, the external urethral orifice, and the openings of the ducts of several glands. The vaginal orifice the opening of the vagina to the exterior occupies the greater portion of the vestibule and is bordered by the hymen. Anterior to the vaginal orifice and posterior to the clitoris is the external urethral orifice, the opening of the urethra to the exterior. On either side of the external urethral orifice, are the openings of the ducts called the paraurethral or Skene's glands. These mucus secreting glands are embedded in the wall of the urethra. The paraurethral glands are homologous to the prostate. On either side of the vaginal orifice itself are the greater vestibular glands. These open by ducts into a groove between the hymen and the labia minora. They produce a small quantity of mucus during sexual arousal and intercourse that adds to the cervical mucus and provides lubrication. The greater vestibular glands are homologous to the bulbourethral glands in males. Several lesser vestibular glands secrete mucus during sexual arousal and intercourse and also open into the vestibule. The bulb of the vestibule consists of two elongated masses of erectile tissue just deep to the labia on either side of the vaginal orifice. The bulb of the vestibule becomes engorged with blood during sexual arousal. This narrows the vaginal orifice and places pressure on the penis during intercourse. The bulb of the vestibule is homologous to the corpus spongiosum and bulb of the penis in males. And this cartoon is on page 1134. This is figure 28.20 continued. And this shows a cartoon of the external anatomy of the female reproductive system. And this cartoon is on page 1136, figure 28.21. This is showing us the perineum of a female. The perineum is a diamond-shaped area that includes the urogenital triangle and the anal triangle. Moving on to table 28.2 on page 1135, this table details the homologous structures of the female and male reproductive systems. Remember, homologs mean that these structures have a common developmental origin. And please go through this table on your own time. Moving on to mammary glands. Each breast is a hemispheric projection of variable size anterior to the pectoralis major and the serratus anterior muscles and is attached to them by a layer of fascia composed of dense irregular connective tissue. Each breast has one pigmented projection, the nipple, that has a series of closely spaced openings of ducts called lactiferous ducts. And milk emerges from the lactiferous ducts. The circular pigmented area of skin surrounding the nipple is called the areola. It appears rough because it contains modified sebaceous glands. Within each breast is a mammary gland. This is a modified sudoriferous gland that produces milk. A mammary gland consists of 15 to 20 lobes or compartments separated by a variable amount of adipose tissue. In each lobe are several smaller compartments called lobules. These are composed of grape-like clusters of milk-secreting glands termed glandular alveoli, and these are embedded in connective tissue. Contraction of myoepithelial cells surrounding the glandular alveoli help propel milk towards the nipples. 
And that brings us to figure 28.22 on page 1136. And this shows the mammary glands within the breasts. The mammary glands function in the synthesis, secretion, and ejection of milk. And the ejection of milk is referred to as lactation. Moving on to the next slide. During their reproductive years, non-pregnant females normally exhibit cyclical changes in the ovaries and uterus. Each cycle takes about a month and involves ogenesis and the preparation of the uterus to receive a fertilized ovum. Hormones secreted by the hypothalamus, anterior pituitary, and ovaries control the main events. The ovarian cycle is a series of events in the ovaries that occur during and after the maturation of an oocyte. The uterine cycle or menstrual cycle is a concurrent series of changes in the endometrium of the uterus to prepare it for arrival of a fertilized ovum that will develop there until birth. If fertilization does not occur, ovarian hormones wane, which causes the functional layer of the endometrium to slough off. The general term female reproductive cycle encompasses the ovarian and uterine cycles, the hormonal changes that regulate them, and the related cyclical changes in the breasts and cervix. And this brings us to page 1138, figure 28.23. This shows the secretion and physiological effects of estrogens, progesterone, relaxin, and inhibin in the female reproductive cycle. The dashed lines indicate negative feedback inhibition. The uterine and ovarian cycles are controlled by gonadotropin-releasing hormone and ovarian hormones such as estrogens and progesterone. Moving on to the next slide. The duration of the female reproductive cycle typically ranges from 24 to 36 days. For this discussion, we assume a duration of 28 days and divide it into four phases. The menstrual phase, the pre-ovulatory phase, ovulation, and the post-ovulatory phase. The menstrual phase, also called menstruation, lasts for roughly the first five days of the cycle. In the ovaries, under the influence of follicle-stimulating hormone, several primordial ovarian follicles develop into primary ovarian follicles and then into secondary ovarian follicles. This developmental process may take several months to occur. Therefore, an ovarian follicle that begins to develop at the beginning of a particular menstrual cycle may not reach maturity and ovulate until several menstrual cycles later. In the uterus, menstrual flow from the uterus consists of 50 to 150 milliliters of blood, tissue fluid, mucus, and epithelial cells shed from the endometrium. This discharge occurs because of the declining levels of progesterone and estrogens that stimulate the release of prostaglandins that cause the uterine spiral arterioles to constrict. As a result, the cells they supply become oxygen-deprived and start to die. Eventually, the entire functional and compact layers slough off. At this time, the endometrium is very thin. The menstrual flow passes from the uterine cavity through the cervix and vagina to the exterior. In the pre-ovulatory phase, this is the time between the end of menstruation and ovulation. The pre-ovulatory phase of the cycle is more variable in length than the other phases and accounts for most of the differences in the length of the cycle. This can last anywhere from 6 to 13 days in a 28-day cycle. In this phase, some of the secondary ovarian follicles in the ovaries begin to secrete estrogens and inhibin. By about day 6, a single secondary ovarian follicle in one of the two ovaries has outgrown all of the others to become the dominant ovarian follicle. Then estrogens and inhibin are secreted by the dominant ovarian follicle, and this decreases the secretion of follicle-stimulating hormone, which causes other less well-developed ovarian follicles to stop growing and degenerate. 
fraternal or non-identical twins or triplets result when two or three secondary ovarian follicles become codominant and later are ovulated and fertilized at about the same time. In the uterus, estrogens are liberated into the blood by the growing ovarian follicles that stimulate the repair of the endometrium cells of the basal layer that undergo mitosis and produce a new functional layer and compact layer. As the endometrium thickens, the short, straight endometrial glands develop and the arterioles coil and lengthen as they penetrate the functional layer. Sometimes this pre-ovulatory phase is called the proliferative phase because the endometrium is proliferating. Ovulation is the rupture of the tertiary ovarian follicle and the release of the secondary oocyte into the pelvic cavity which occurs on day 14 in a 28-day cycle. During ovulation, the secondary oocyte remains surrounded by its zona pellucida and corona radiata. The high levels of estrogens during the last part of the pre-ovulatory phase exert a positive feedback effect on the cells that secrete luteinizing hormone and gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and this causes ovulation as follows. A high concentration of estrogens stimulates more frequent release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. It also directly stimulates gonadotrophins in the anterior pituitary to secrete luteinizing hormone. Then, the gonadotropin-releasing hormone pr promotes the release of follicle-stimulating hormone and additional luteinizing hormone by the anterior pituitary. Then, luteinizing hormone causes the rupture of the tertiary ovarian follicle and the expulsion of a secondary oocyte about nine hours after the peak of the luteinizing hormone surge. The ovulated oocyte and its corona radiata cells are usually swept into the uterine tube. The post-ovulatory phase of the female reproductive cycle is the time between ovulation and the onset of the next menstruation. In duration, it is the most constant part of the female reproductive cycle. It lasts for 14 days in a 28-day cycle from day 15 to day 28. After ovulation, the tertiary ovarian follicle collapses and the basement membrane between the granulosa cells and the theca interna break down. Later events in an ovary that is ovulated and oocyte depend on whether the oocyte is fertilized. If the oocyte is not fertilized, the corpus luteum has a lifespan of only about two weeks. Then the secretory activity declines and it degenerates into a corpus albicans. As the levels of progesterone, estrogens, and inhibin decrease, release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone rise due to the loss of negative feedback suppression by the ovarian hormones. Then follicular growth resumes and a new ovarian cycle begins. On the other hand, if the secondary oocyte is fertilized and begins to divide, the corpus luteum persists past its normal two-week lifespan. It is rescued from degeneration by human chorionic gonadotropin. This is a hormone produced by the chorion of the embryo beginning at about eight days after fertilization. Like luteinizing hormone, Human chorionic gonadotropin stimulates the secretory activities of the corpus luteum. The presence of human chorionic gonadotropin in maternal blood or urine is an indicator of pregnancy and is the hormone detected by home pregnancy tests. In the uterus, progesterone and estrogens produced by the corpus luteum promote growth and coiling of the endometrial glands. Vascularization of the superficial endometrium and the thickening of the endometrium because of the secretory activity of the endometrial glands, which begin to secrete glycogen. This period is called the secretory phase of the uterine cycle. These preparatory changes peak at about one week after ovulation at the time of a fertilized ovum might arrive 
in the uterus. If fertilization does not occur, the levels of progesterone and estrogens decline due to the degeneration of the corpus luteum, and then withdrawal of the progesterone and estrogens causes menstruation. And this cartoon is located on page 1139, figure 28.24. And this shows an overview of the female reproductive cycle. So the length of the female reproductive cycle is typically 24 to 36 days. The pre-ovulatory phase is more variable in length than the other phases. And this cartoon, letter A, shows the events in the ovarian and uterine cycles and the release of anterior pituitary hormones that are correlated with the sequence of the cycle's four phases. In the cycle shown, fertilization and implantation have not occurred. Moving on to the next slide, we see letter B, and this shows the relative concentrations of anterior pituitary hormones, such as follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, and other ovarian hormones, such as estrogens and progesterone, during the phases of a normal female reproductive cycle. Moving on to the next slide, feedback is important in regulating hormonally controlled cycles. The high levels of estrogens during the last part of the pre-ovulatory phase have a positive feedback effect on the cell secreting luteinizing hormone and gonadotropin releasing hormone, and this brings about ovulation. It should also be noted that there are many hormonal interactions between the ovarian and uterine cycles. And this brings us to page 1142, figure 28.26. And this summarizes the hormonal interactions in the ovarian and uterine cycles. So we can see hormones from the anterior pituitary regulate ovarian functions, and hormones from the ovaries regulate the changes in the endometrial lining of the uterus. Moving on to the next slide, birth control or contraception refers to restricting the number of children by various methods designed to control fertility and prevent conception. No single ideal method of birth control exists. The only method of preventing pregnancy that is 100% reliable is complete abstinence. Abstinence is the avoidance of sexual intercourse. Other methods of birth control include surgical sterilization, Sterilization is a procedure that renders an individual incapable of further reproduction. Another option is hormonal methods. Aside from the complete abstinence or surgical sterilization, hormonal methods are the most effective means of birth control. Oral contraceptives, such as the pill, contain hormones designed to prevent pregnancy. Another method is periodic abstinence. A couple can use their knowledge of the physiological changes that occur during the female reproductive cycle to decide to either abstain from intercourse or engage in it. And this brings us to table 28.3 on page 1144. And this table summarizes birth control methods. So please review this table on your own time. This table is the same table, same page. Again, same table. Please review this on your own time. Barrier methods, same table, same page. Periodic abstinence, same table, same page. Moving on to the next slide, the reproductive systems develop from several structures and require several chemical substances. The gonads develop from intermediate mesoderm that gives rise to the gonadal ridges. The mesonopheric ducts develop into the male reproductive system, and the paromesonpheric ducts develop into the female reproductive system. And this cartoon is on page 1148, figure 28.28. 28. 
We are looking at letter A, and this is showing the development of the male genital system. The gonads develop from the intermediate mesoderm. Moving on to the next slide, the developing nurse cells secrete a hormone called Mullerian inhibiting substance. This causes apoptosis of the cells in the paromesenferic ducts. As a result, those cells do not contribute any functional structures to the male reproductive system. Stimulated by human chorionic gonadotropin, primitive interstitial endocrine cells in the testes begin to secrete androgen testosterone during the eighth week. Testosterone then stimulates the development of the mesonopheric duct on each side into the epididymis, ductus deferens, ejaculatory duct, and seminal glands. The testes connect to the mesonopheric duct through a series of tubules that eventually become the seminiferous tubules. The prostate and bulbourethral glands are endodermal outgrowths of the urethra. Moving on to the next slide, we're back at figure 28.28 28 on page 1148, and this time we're looking at the development of the female genital system. And this next cartoon is figure 28.29 on 1149. This shows the development of the external genitals. The external genitals of the male and female embryos remain undifferentiated until about the eighth week. Moving on to the next slide, before differentiation into male or female, all embryos have urethral folds, a urethral groove, a genital tubercle, and labial scrotal swelling. Aging in the genital systems begins on page 1149. During the first decade of life, the genital system is in a juvenile state. At about age 10, hormone-directed changes occur to both sexes. Puberty is the period when sexual characteristics begin to develop and the potential for sexual reproduction is reached. And when males reach puberty, they begin to pr produce sperm. And when females reach puberty, they begin menstruation. Moving on to the next slide, with age, fertility declines. In women between 30 and 40 years of age, ovarian follicles become exhausted and estrogen levels decline. And in men, reproduction is still possible in the 80s or 90s. However, at around age 55, testosterone levels begin to decline, sperm levels drop, and sexual desire wanes. And most males over 60 experience benign prostatic hypertrophy, where the prostate enlarges to two to four times its normal size. And this brings us to our focus on homeostasis on page 1151. And this goes through the contributions of the genital system for all body systems. The male and female genital systems produce gametes, which are sperm and oocytes, that unite to form embryos and fetuses, which contain cells that divide and differentiate to form all of the organ systems of their body. And I'll let you go through this on your own time. Moving on to disorders and homeostatic imbalances. In the reproductive systems, this begins on page 1150. In men, they can have testicular cancer. This is the most common cancer in males between the ages of 20 and 35. Prostate disorders. Because the prostate surrounds part of the urethra, any infection, enlargement, or tumor can obstruct the flow of urine. And men can also experience erectile dysfunction. This is the consistent inability of an adult male to ejaculate or to attain or hold an erection long enough for sexual intercourse. Women also have homeostatic imbalances or disorders that can interfere with their reproductive system. One is premenstrual syndrome, and this is a cyclical disorder of severe physical and emotional distress. 
Premenstrual dystrophic disorder is a more severe syndrome in which PMS-like signs and symptoms do not resolve after the onset of menstruation. Endometriosis is characterized by the growth of endometrial tissue outside of the uterus. Breast cancer. One in eight women in the United States faces the prospect of breast cancer. After lung cancer, it is the second leading cause of death from cancer in U.S. women. Breast cancer can also occur in males, but this is very rare. Ovarian and cervical cancer. Even though ovarian cancer is the sixth most common form of cancer in females, it is a leading cause of death from all gynecological malignancies. This, in part, this is due because it's difficult to defect before it metastasizes. Cervical cancer is a carcinoma of the cervix of the uterus that affects about 12,000 females a year in the United States with a mortality rate of about 4,000 annually. Yeast infections. Candidia albicans is a yeast-like fungus that commonly grows on mucous membranes of the digestive canal and the genourinary tracts. The organism is responsible for vulvovaginal candidias, the most common form of vaginitis. Moving on to the next slide, a sexually transmitted infection is one that is spread by sexual contact. Chlamydia is a sexually transmitted bacterial infection. In males, urethritis is the principal result, causing a clear discharge, burning on urination, frequent urination, and painful urination. Without treatment, epididymides may also become infected, inflamed, and lead to sterility. In 70% of females with chlamydia, symptoms are absent, but chlamydia is the leading cause of pelvic inflammatory disease. The uterine tubes may become inflamed or infected, which increases the risk of ectoptic pregnancy and infertility due to the formation of scar tissue in the tubes. Trichomonius is a very common STI and is considered the most curable. It's caused by a protozoan, Trichomonas vaginalis, which is, normal, which is a normal inhabitant of the vagina in females and the urethra in males. Most infected people do not have any signs or symptoms. When symptoms are present, they include itching, burning, genital soreness, discomfort with urination, and an unusual smelling discharge in females. Males experience itching or irritation in the penis, burning after urination or ejaculation, or some discharge. Gonorrhea is another STI caused by a bacteria. In this STI, males usually experience urethritis with profuse pus drainage and painful urination. The prostate and epididymis may become infected. In females, this infection typically occurs in the vagina, often with a discharge of pus. Many times, females are asymptomatic with this disease. Syphilis is caused by a bacteria. It is transmitted through sexual contact or the exchange of blood or through the placenta to a fetus. Genital herpes is a viral infection, and this STI can produce painful blisters on the prepuce, glans penis, and penile shaft in males, and on the vulva, or sometimes high up in the vagina in females. The blisters that it forms may reappear or disappear, but the virus will remain in the body, whether there are blisters or not. Genital warts are also a viral STI, and they can cause single or multiple bumps in the genital area. And that concludes tonight's lecture.